Hi everyone, so I figured I would talk about um, some influential Puerto Ricans here and there on this channel. Um, regardless of whether they were born here in the States, I feel like if they were doing things uh, politically that affected um, both the island and the people who lived um, here in the mainland, I figured I would talk about them. So one of the people that I wanted to speak about is uh, Lolita Lebron. So... Um, she was born um, in November 19th, 1919, and she died in August 1st, 2010. And she was a Puerto Rican nationalist who was convicted of attempted murder and other crimes after leading an assault on the United States House Representatives in 1954, resulting in the wounding of five members of the United States Congress. She was freed from prison in 1979 after being granted clemency by President Jimmy Carter. LeBron was born and raised in Lares, Puerto Rico, where she joined the Liberal Party. In her youth, she met Francisco Matos Paoli, a Puerto Rican poet with whom she had a relationship. In 1941, LeBron migrated to New York City, where she joined the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, gaining influence within the party's leadership. Within the organization, she advocated socialist and feminist ideas. In 1952, after the Constitution of Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, was promulgated, the Nationalist Party began a series of revolutionary actions, including the Guaya Uprising. As part of this initiative, Pedro Albizu Campos ordered her to organize attacks on the United States, focusing on locations that were the most strategic to the enemy. She became the leader of a group of nationalists who attacked the United States House of Representatives in 1954. She was incarcerated as a result. LeBron remained in prison for 25 years when President Carter issued pardons to the group involved. After their release in 1979, the Nationalists returned to Puerto Rico where independence movements received them with a celebration. During the following years, she continued her involvement in pro-independence activities, including the Navy Vieques protest. Her life would be subsequently detailed in books and a documentary. On August 1st, 2010, LeBron died of complications of cardiorespiratory infection. Although LeBron was a member of the Liberal Party from a young age, she didn't display any interest in politics. However, her, her posture changed after March 21st, 1937, when a group of militants from the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party were killed during a peaceful protest, which became known as the Ponce Massacre. LeBron, who was 18 years old at the time, developed a nationalistic ideology following this event. During this time frame, LeBron had a relationship with a local engineer following the advice of her family. When she was 21 years old, she gave birth to her first daughter, Gladys, who was left in Rafaela Luciano's custody after LeBron was separated from her husband and moved to New York. After she arrived in New York, she started to experience problems finding employment, mostly because she did not fully understand English. LeBron worked as a seamstress in several factories. She was fired from some of her jobs because she was considered a rebel by her bosses after she protested against the discrimination which she witnessed against Puerto Rican workers. That's right. This influenced her nationalistic views and even further, she and she eventually established a contact with members of the Puerto Rican Liberation Movement. She enrolled at George Washington College, where she studied for two years during her free time from work. She married again when she was 22 years old and gave birth to her second child, whom she would send to Puerto Rico to live with her mother a year later. LeBron decided to divorce her husband because she felt he was oppressing her. <laughs> I'm sorry. In 1943, there was a massive migration of Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico to New York, composed mostly of Hebrews seeking employment. LeBron grew increasingly frustrated when she observed how they were forced to live in poverty and under social decadence, and she increased her work with nationalist circles. In 1946, she formally became a member of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, following the advice of a friend. During this time, she developed an admiration for the party's president, Pedro Alpizo Campos, studying and memorizing his biography and ideals. After joining the party, LeBron inadvertently included some of her own initiatives within the organization's ideals. 
These were influenced by socialist and feminist ideals, seeking more involvement in society and politics for women, new economic systems and social reforms that would protect women and children. Her constant involvement in the party's affairs earned her several high-ranking positions, among them a secretary, vice president, and exec executive delegate of its delegation in New York. On May 21, 1948, a bill was introduced before the Puerto Rican Senate, which would restrain the rights of the independence and nationalist movements on the island. The Senate at the time was controlled by the PPD and presided by uh, Luis Munoz Marin, approved the bill. The bill, also known as the Ley de Mar Mordaza, <laughs> made it illegal to display a Puerto Rican flag, to sing a patriotic tune, to talk of independence, and to fight for the independence of the island. The bill, which resembled the anti-communist Smith Law passed in the United States, was signed and made into law on June 10, 1948, by the U.S. appointed governor of Puerto Rico, Jesus T. Pinero, and became known as Lay 53, Law 53. In accordance to the new law, it would be a crime to print, publish, sell, to exhibit, or organize, or to help anyone organize any society, group, or assembly of people whose intentions are to paralyze or destroy the insular government. Anyone accused and found, uh, and found guilty of disobeying the law could be sentenced to 10 years of prison and be fined $10,000 or both. According to Leopoldo Figueroa, a member of the Puerto Rican House of Representatives, the law was representative and in, was in violation of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees freedom of speech. He pointed out that the law was such a violation of the civil rights of the people of Puerto Rico. On November 1st, 1950, following a series of uprisings in Puerto Rico, which included the Guaya Uprising and the Utado Uprising, which culminated in a massacre, Oscar Colasso and Griselo Torresola invaded Harry S. Truman's residence, carrying a letter written by Alpiso Campos and addressed to Truman. A shootout erupted between the duo and the guard stations there, killing Torresola. Calozaro was badly injured but survived and sentenced to death by an American jury. The Puerto Rican Nationalist Party claimed that their goal was to draw attention to the fact of Puerto Rico's continued colonial status, while the American government and media treated it as an assassinate, assassination attempt. Following the sentence, LeBron quickly joined the committee for Oscar Colasso's defense, participating in numerous public manifestations which eventually led to a presidential pardon. On 1925-1952, the official name of Puerto Rico was changed to Estado Libre Asociado, Commonwealth of the United States, as the Constitution was promulgated by Luis Munoz Martin, the island's first elected govern governor. In 1954, Lebron Rezi received a letter from Alpiso Campos in which he declared his intention to order attacks on three locations the most strategic to the enemy. Apiso Campos had been corresponding with 34-year-old Lebron from prison and chose a group of nationalists who included Rafael Cancel Miranda, Irvin Flores, and Andres Figueroa Cordero to attack locations in Washington, D.C. Upon receiving the order, she communicated to the leadership of the Nationalist Party in New York, and although two members unexpectedly disagreed, the plan continued. LeBron decided to lead the group, even though Apiso Campos did not order her to directly take part in the assault. She studied the plan, determining the possible weakness, including that a single attack on the House of Representatives could be more effective. The day for the attack on the House of Representatives was to be March 1st, 1954. This date was chosen because it coincided with the inauguration of the Conferencia Interamericana in Caracas. Hear how terrible my Spanish is. LeBron intended to call attention to Puerto Rico's independent cause, particularly among the Latin American countries participating in the conference. The attack. On the morning of March 1st, LeBron traveled to Grand Central Terminal where she rendezvoused with the group, with the rest of the group. Once they arrived at the United States Capitol, Rafael Cantor Miranda suggested that the attack should be postponed because it was late and rainy. LeBron responded, I am alone and continued towards the buildings 
interior. The group followed, considering the attack a coup d'etat, the most important revolutionary act in the history of Puerto Rican independence movement, the fourth. When LeBron's group reached the visitor's gallery above the chamber in the house, they sat while the representatives discussed Mexico's economy. Shortly thereafter, LeBron gave the order to the other members. The group quickly recited the Lord's Prayer. Then LeBron stood up and shouted, Long live a free Puerto Rico and unfurl the flag of Puerto Rico. The group opened fire with semi-automatic pistols. LeBron claimed that she fired her shots at the ceiling while Figueroa's pistol jammed. Some 30 shots were fired, wounding five lawmakers. One representative, Alvin Bentley from Michigan, was seriously wounded in the chest. Upon being arrested, LeBron yelled, I did not come to kill anyone. I came to die for Puerto Rico. LeBron and her comrades were charged with attempted murder and other crimes. She was imprisoned in the Federal Correctional Institution for Women in Alderson, West Virginia. The trial began on June 4, 1954, with Judge Alexander Holsoff presiding over the case under strict security measures. A jury composed of seven men and five women was assembled. Their identities were kept secret from the media. The prosecution was led by Leo A. Rover. As a part of this process, 33 witness, witnesses testified. Ruth Mary Reynolds, the American Puerto Rican nationalist and organization which she founded, American League for Puerto Rico's Independence, came to the defense of LeBron and three other nationalists. LeBron and other members of the group were only defense witnesses. As part of, as part of her testimony, she reaffirmed that they came to die for the liberty of her homeland. As part of her 20-minute speech to the jury at her trial, LeBron stated that she was being crucified for the freedom of my country. During the early part of their trial, she remained calm, complaining through her lawyer's alleged disrespect for the flag while it was being produced as evidence. She loudly protested when the defense su suggested that the group might have suffered from mental instability while committing the, de while committing the deed. On June 16, 1954, the jury found all four defendants guilty. On the morning of, of July 8, 1954, LeBron learned of her son's death minutes before the sentence was to be announced. She was quiet at the beginning of the hearing, but at one point, unable to contain herself, she became hysterical. Rover demanded the death penalty, but Holsoff chose to sentence them to the longest terms of imprisonment possible. In LeBron's case, this was between 16 and 50 years, depending on her behavior. Back at the prison, she went into shock upon receiving official notice of her son's death and did not speak for three days. On July 13, 1954, the four nationalists were taken to New York, where they pleaded not guilty to the charges of trying to overthrow the government of the United States. One of the witnesses for the prosecution was Gonzalo LeBron Jr., who testified against his sister. On October 26, 1954, Judge Lawrence E. Walsh found all the defendants guilty of conspiracy and sentenced them to six additional years in prison. LeBron had stated that the first two years... No, 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 stop. Stop. LeBron has stated that the first two years in prison were the most difficult, having to deal with the deaths of her son and mother. Communication with her siblings was non-existent. LeBron refused to accept letters from her sister because only letters written in English were permitted in the prison. Communication with the outside world was not allowed. Late, later, it was granted after several inmates went on a hunger strike that lasted three and a half days. Due to her participation, LeBron was not allowed to perform outside of herself for some time although she was eventually allowed to work in the infirmary. While in prison, a group of judges offered her parole in exchange for a public apology, which she indignantly rejected. After completing the first 15 years of the sentence, LeBron's social worker told her that she could ask for parole, but she did not display interest in the proposal, never signing the required document. Due to this lack of interest, she was mandated to attend a meeting before a penitentiary committee where she presented a written disposition expressing her position about the, par about the parole proposal, as well as other subjects including terrorism, politics, and the United States' use of the atomic bomb. Following this, the other inmates rejected with skepticism 
react, excuse me, reacted with skepticism over her intentions to refuse the offer, which made her distance herself from them and focus her attention in studying as well as writing poetry. During this time frame, LeBron's interest in religion grew. LeBron's daughter Gladys died in 1977 while her mother was in prison. That is terrible. Among homages received by LeBron are paintings, books, and documentaries. Mexican artist Octavio Ocampo created a poster of LeBron, which was exhibited at the Galleria de la Raza in San Francisco, California. In Chicago's Humboldt Park, there is a, a mural depicting LeBron among other well-known Puerto Ricans. Writer, director, and film producer Judith Escalona is planning to make a film about LeBron's life. Federico Rives Tovar published a book titled Lolita La Prisonera. There is a plaque located at the Monument of the Guaya Uprising, participants in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, honoring the women of Puerto Rican Nationalist Party. LeBron's name is the first one on the third plate. So I figured I would talk about her because um, I, I think that... She, <laughs> Every time I hear about her and I, the stuff that I've read about her is, I feel like her personality was is so similar to mine. <laughs> um, people may not see that, or they may see that. I don't know, just by how my temperament is on on YouTube. Um, people may see the <laughs> similarities, and some people may not. But um, she had a, a, a very. Um, she had a very tough life, especially with um being incarcerated while being incarcerated, um, losing two of her children and um her mother. That I mean, I, it, there's there's no words for that, you know. And it just shows the the strength that she had, in in fighting for what she believed in, and you know, in fighting for the island, and um she was she really was literally um putting her life on the line when she did that so um i thought that was very admirable um anyhow i'm going to go for now i hope that you all enjoyed this and i will see you guys in my next video bye